The clues were present, but the proof was missing. That proof was locked behind the Iron Curtain and would remain so as long as the Cold War continued. By the end of 1979, the investigation into Markov's murder had ground to a halt. For 10 years, the case lay dormant. Then came the collapse of communism. In February 1990, three months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was Bulgaria's turn to celebrate. With riots spreading across the capital, Markov's nemesis, President Todor Zhivkov, was deposed and placed under house arrest on charges of corruption. After nearly half a century of communist rule, one of the most secretive countries in Eastern Europe began opening itself up to outside scrutiny. Jack Hamilton was one of the first Western journalists to move to the new Bulgaria. When he arrived in the country, there was great hope that the Georgi Markov case might now be solved. In 1990, the British thought that this was an opportunity to open up the case and to start working with the Bulgarians. What the British investigation needed was information from the archives of the uh, Bulgarian Foreign Intelligence Service, the former state security. Everyone knew or assumed that the Bulgarian authorities were, were behind this murder, but who had actually committed it was completely unknown. One of Jack's first assignments in Bulgaria was at a press conference given by the former president, Todor Zhivkov, shortly after his release from house arrest. Jack was the only journalist that dared to ask him about the Georgia Markov case. Zhivkov made a joke about it. He made a joke about the umbrella, which made me very angry. Well, I remember when I asked the question, there was a sort of stir. The fact that I was asking the man who, who was responsible for what happened, you know, the, 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 the former dictator. Todor Zhivkov would never admit his role in the Georgi Markov murder, and he died shortly after this. However, the new post-communist government opened their own investigation into the murder in 1991. After years of disappointment for Markov's family, there seemed to be a glimmer of hope. Jack is traveling to meet the policeman who took on the case, Bogdan Karyatov. For a brief period, Karyatov was given access to archives from the communist era. He discovered crucial documents which proved conclusively that Markov had been a target of Bulgarian state security. We discovered that Markov's name first appears in the official records in 1974. We found Markov's card index record which said his code name was Skitnik, that means tramp. Markov's dossier contained tantalizing clues about how communist intelligence planned to deal with him. We found a document in the archive of the Foreign Intelligence Department, which said there were plans for Georgi Markov to be neutralized. That's exactly how it was written, neutralized. But we couldn't find out what the plans were because the relevant documents had disappeared. Someone had disposed of the documents illegally. They'd been destroyed. The loss of this crucial evidence was a major setback in Bogdan Karyatov's investigation. The man who confessed to burning the Markov documents was General Vladimir Todorov. 
a former head of state security during the communist period. Todorov fled to Moscow, but eventually returned to Bulgaria to face trial. He was jailed for 16 months, but was released six months later. Todorov is still alive, and Jack has tracked him down to an association for former state security officers. John Hamilton. Todorov's mysterious flight to Moscow may also explain why he removed the Markov files. As a high-ranking intelligence officer during Bulgaria's communist era, he worked alongside the KGB for his entire career. Todorov was a go-between when the KGB supplied the weapon and poison to the Bulgarians. Todorov destroyed those documents because the entire Bulgarian state security um, was uh, incredibly co closely li linked to the, to, to, to the Russian KGB. The KGB have never admitted publicly to their role in Markov's murder. As for Vladimir Todorov, his military status meant that he was never fully interrogated by police investigator Bogdan Karyatov. Although so much evidence had disappeared, Karyatov unearthed a crucial dossier that would blow the case wide open again. The documents not only confirmed that Markov was a target, they also named the individual chosen to carry out the killing. We found the name of an agent working for the Bulgarian intelligence service in the documents. He was based in Denmark and had been assigned to deal with Markov. The documents said that the agent was codenamed Piccadilly and he'd been given instructions about dealing with Georgi Markov. He was living in Denmark under the name Gulino, Francesco Gulino. Francesco Gulino was an Italian petty criminal who was arrested in Bulgaria on smuggling charges in 1971. After Bulgarian state security persuaded him to work for them, Galino posed as an art dealer in Copenhagen, traveling around Europe in a caravan. The files confirmed that Galino had made several trips to London right up to the time of Markov's death. He was sent from Denmark to England for 40 days in 1977 and stayed close to the house where Markov lived. This was the breakthrough that the British police had been hoping for. Scotland Yard received the Galino dossier from Bogdan Karyatov. Together, they were able to track down Francesco Galino in Copenhagen, and he was brought in for questioning. In February 1993, unknown to the outside world, the police of Britain, Bulgaria and Denmark interrogated Galino about his work for Bulgarian state security and his involvement in the Markov case. The police tried to keep the interrogation top secret, but the story was leaked to Danish journalist Ola Damke. I had a tip here in Copenhagen that there was a, an Italian guy involved in the, in the Markov case, and he had been, been charged with uh, espionage. But the interesting thing is that apparently they, they were lacking uh, evidence. Uh, so they gave up the case and, and he was free to leave. I mean, he left for Hungary, so, so they didn't try to, to keep him back. It could be that, that it could be somehow embarrassing for the, for the Danish authorities uh, if, if, if there was a court case and Mr. Golino told 
what he what he actually had been doing in Denmark since '74, how he was how he, he how he was allowed to come here, and but but that's speculation.